Okay, so we'll go on to the, uh, the problem then. We can go through some of these uh, slides quite quickly because... Uh, So we'll talk about ovulation failure uh, and we'll talk about fluid accumulation. We'll have to just check we're all on the same page about normal ovulation uh, because we can't really talk about abnormal ovulation if we're not sure what normal ovulation is. Uh, so I guess we'd all have a different list. If I asked you to write down what you think a problem is, I don't suggest for a minute you would come up with the same list as me. Uh, but this is, this is what I would pick as, as the biggest problems for me. Persistent fluid accumulation and or infection despite repeated treatments. Could be anatomical problems. Uh, mares which don't cycle normally. Mares that repeatedly produce anovulatory follicles. Mares that lose the early pregnancy. Mares that do not become pregnant despite repeated breedings with no obvious cause. If you ask me to name my problem mares, that's probably the list. And I guess have it, you, know, you may have them in different order, but I can't really think. It's a pretty all-encompassing section, selection, eh? What, just as an interest there, what would you guys think about? That? What, what's something that I'm very fussy to eliminate in mares that do not become pregnant despite repeated breedings with no obvious cause? What would be very important to check? Well, yeah, you, you, I mean, well, I was thinking more, you, you, you've got to think of the stallion, really. Now, you can't send, you, you know, sometimes, uh, no, I say, it to, yeah, and I'm very small. I don't say many things to you guys. You're all bigger than me. Uh, so I tread very carefully, uh, very subtly, but... No, you, you, and most times what you mustn't be is the mare owner who the minute the mare doesn't go in foal blames the stallion because in most cases it isn't. But if, you're, if I'm finding no reason with a young mare when she goes to stud, uh, you, you have to just think at the back of your mind it could be a stallion problem. So you have to make subtle inquiries. You have to see if you can hear if anything's going on that it's not very good. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You never know what that, I, I hear that a bit, and you, you never really know what that means, really. Uh, yes, I mean, the whole veterinary world is, has become a thing called evidence-based obsessed, and there's absolutely no doubt that statistically, I, I agree with you, that sounds odd. Statistically, that would actually mean nothing. That, that would be no indication that, that uh, one thing or the other. Uh, but nonetheless, you can't help but be, because I'm not a particular fan of evidence-based medicine. I think a lot of what we do is subjective. Uh, and, and you certainly, the feeling is, well, you know, maybe something was happening. Uh, but, but even with stallion problems, stallion problems can be low sperm count, but they can be managemental. If somebody doesn't cover the mares properly, uh, well, it doesn't matter how good the the sperm is the mare's not going to go in foal so uh, the idea that a certain mare doesn't conceive to a certain stallion is something which I've I've heard across the world uh, several times but it, th there's nothing really written with any science about that it, it's not something you can you can prove uh, but but you do hear a lot of examples as to what you say there. and was that did they was that at the same stud farm Okay, okay, no, well, we won't say that. No, very, very good. I had a mare that I bought on... We, we, don't, want to, we don't want to start an, a mare stallion war, guys, so, so don't, don't blame me, anybody. I'm just the middle person. Um, I, I had a mare that I bought on uh, some sale that she'd only had two foals in seven years, which was very well bred. Yes, I, I used to get those. They're so, nice, those mares. So I take a chance. Yeah. 
and I sent off her blood to Honest to Court, which is our yeah, yeah. funding thing. And they found that the mayor was only compatible to four stallions in the country at the time. Right. And she had eight foals in nine years for me. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, compatibility just hasn't been very well studied, really. So we're only left with these anecdotal stories, really. But there does, there does seem sim something in it. So, you know, the, the difficulty is you could cover a mare with a stallion three times she doesn't conceive. You could cover her the fourth time she conceives. Uh, no, so it becomes... They won't get you back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think, I think we'll... Well, I don't want to dwell on this. This is just how we record mares. Uh, and I just like this, uh, two things. I like to make the point that it's very, very important to always look for the presence of a CL, but we've talked about that. And I'm, I'm curious what you guys do with this. Uh, when you're follicle testing the mares, uh, at what size does your vet say, or if you are the vet, what size do you do? Do you first record... You know, do you record it when the follicle's 20 millimetres, 25, 35, 40? What do, what do you think? Or maybe, we'll, well, we'll, we'll, I think we'll, we'll... Here's one I prepared earlier. This was obviously from wherever I gave this talk the last, because time's getting on a little bit, guys. And, and, uh, and I, would, I would largely agree with this, that I would be in category three. I begin to record any follicle above 25 millimetres. I think there's nothing wrong with waiting till 30 millimetres. Uh, I think a follicle's incredibly unlikely in a thoroughbred to ovulate below 30 millimetres. But a very small percentage will, I picked out that 27 millimetre follicle earlier. Uh, I, I think you're a chancer if you, if you number, whoever he was or she was in number five. Uh, that, that's, I, you know, 35 millimetres is pretty high to be. You may get away with it, but I think as a routine, we're somewhere between 25 and 30. Uh, I don't know why I've got, that's another plug for our book, but uh, yeah, I suppose there's some very good chapter in McKinnon's book, yeah, on ultrasound. Uh, so you can, this information has, is out there if you want to know more about these things. Now, I just thought we'd refresh here with equine stud work. What do we get? Well. Do, do, I don't know whether you get quite as much anestrus, I'm trying to recollect, but I think you do get mares not cycling very well at the start of the season, don't you? It, it is a massive problem for us in the UK. Uh, I'm guessing you would here, because this is a slide from I used to go backwards and forwards to uh, Queensland in Australia, uh, and we saw uh, mares not cycling very well in, in, in the beginning of September for them. So it, of course... It isn't a, it's a light thing. So uh, I've only once, I once had the opportunity to do, uh, call in a stud in Venezuela, which is really almost on the equator. And there the mares do stop. They don't have a cycling pattern. They, they, they have a, a fixed period of cycling. It's 13, 14 months. So they do come into a, a, a period of cycling and not cycling, but it has absolutely nothing to do uh, with clearly with, with the time of year because there's no variation in light pattern on the, when you're actually on the equator. Um, but everywhere else, even in hot countries, uh, you do get a problem. I think it's particularly compounded in the UK where it's wet and cold and bad weather as well. Uh, but there's no doubt that, that a majority of, of, of mares uh, will be not cycling or will be anestrous. And what, what we hope as, as owners, breeders and, and veterinarians is that as the season progresses, more and more cycle and eventually become pregnant. And why do we want to manipulate the estrus cycle? And this applies to us whether we're breeder or vet. Well, we want ovulatory heats early in the season. Uh, you know, you've got to get your maiden and, and barren mares out the way early because y y you, don't, you want a number of those covered in in foal before your mare's foaling come online. We've, we've talked about your foaling mares, you're a little bit tired for when you can begin with them. But, but so, so you don't want, you know, all your mares foaling in March, April and May, and you haven't got your maiden and barren mares covered. So we, we do quite a bit of lighting. Do you use lights over here much or? Yes. Yeah. And do you use many of the masks or is people still using light? Yeah, some people use the masks or the light. They're quite pricey, those masks. 
yeah, the difficulty why I don't think we'll use them is we could possibly have them on the... They are expensive, but it's a fact that it's not a big... Ours are in anyway, so it's no big deal to, to have them in under lights. Yeah. Yes, I suppose you'll get exceptions to the rule. Yeah, yeah, you'll always do that. I, don't ever tell my clients that I have a hell of a job to get them to put them under lights anyway. Uh, I still, by and large, think a mayor will cycle better under a lighting regime, but there will always be exceptions. I mean, because other things might have been involved. I mean, what we're trying to do is breed the mayor at the right time. And I guess we've several criteria. Uh, we breed the, the, the easy answer is we breed the mayor when she's ready. When is the mayor ready? No, that isn't when the mayor's ready to be bred. No, that isn't when the mayor's ready. I don't, come, John, come quickly, come quickly. My mayor must be covered today, you know, because the poor thing's had a pee in the field, you know. This will be a good one for here. When the owner manager tells the vet. I bet that's what you think, Pippa, isn't it, that answer? No. Well, I, unfortunately, I have news for you. It, it's, it's the other way. It's when the vet tells the owner-manager. So there may be a dispute about four or five there. But uh, The serious little bit of information is that, is that I do think as veterinarians looking at mares, we have take that's our... If we, we take that responsibility, and we then have to give the correct information... Uh, it, it's, you know, all the future decisions, you know, a, a mayor can't leave the crush without your saying when you want to see it again. I, I, you know, it doesn't drift away and, oh, maybe tease it a bit and bring it back or whenever you like. Bang, no, it's, it's this C4, C7, C2. I, that, you, you've got to do that. If, you got, if, if we're going to say it's our, in our hands, we've got to tick the box for them, haven't we? And edema, we know, we've, we've, we've looked at all that. You're all happy with edema patterns. Everybody grades edema, what, 0 to 4 or 1 to 3? Or... You always get those little bits of outliers. I mean, I'm, I'm nervous of those mares being very susceptible because I think that's, that's sort of too, too much, really. And there's to refresh you, the normal picture there. And this is all about timing of breeding, which I, this slide, of course, holds true. Uh, Time of breeding is, is critical to maximise fertility. I'm, 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 I think it's less critical in, in the thoroughbred world uh, because I think there's no doubt with natural cover or a fresh AI, that's a good technique we'll use in, in the non-thoroughbred if, if you're having trouble with a mere pooling fluid or whatever, fresh AI is a great way to do it. But not open for you guys. 48 to 72 hours plus. We used to, you know, uh, when I first started, uh, if you covered a mare, two days later the mare owner was always ringing up, have you, uh, did you have to cover again or did she go off? Uh, the cross cover. We would have almost stopped cross covering thoroughbred mares now. We very rarely cover them twice in a cycle. Is, would that be the same here or? Not allowed to. <laughs> you know, yeah, not that's allowed. taught them well, you see. Good, well done. You tell them. You only need one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, we don't, we'll have to have mayor owners one side, stallion owners the other, I think. Uh, I, no, I mean, there's, it, it, it very rarely, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it lasts, and we're actually pushing that figure out and out and out. It, it, it's, and this has influences, you know, it ties in with when we scan, we all know when we scan mares at 15, 16 days, sometimes you'll see a nice 16 day pregnancy in a day 11. Uh, and they're real, you have to be so careful with twins in thoroughbreds because of natural covering, sperm living such a long time. Drops way down for chilled and frozen semen, you see. But, but so I think it's less critical for us. Yeah. I think you could rely 
perfect. Our routine would be four days we take as, as a minimum. Uh, because our routine would be, if, if I say I arranged to cover the mayor, let's say I'm going to say she's covered Monday, we would always look at a Tuesday. Uh, we, we, we would do that when I was there. We'd always look at it the next day. Not to check she'd ovulated, but to do the treatment or to see what was going on. I then make an evaluation. I may not have even given the mayor Corillon, but in most cases I may have done. Uh, but I may not even have given her Corillon. I would look at her on, that, uh, on the Tuesday, the next day, after covering, and I'd think, oh, uh, maybe she's not going to ovulate within three days. I'd better give her some Corillon. Uh, but she'll get put a C3 in the book. I won't, now, I won't see that mayor for another three days. Uh, because I, I, if you look at her the next day and she's not ovulated, you're just, you're just in no man, you're not going to do anything, so it's pointless. I wouldn't be wanting to cover that mare again unless she's not ovulated by, by three days further on from that. That's four days from her first cover. And really, guys, if you think about it, that's unlikely to happen, isn't it? If a mare's just ovulated, yeah. um, and you, you miss it because the stallion was full, yeah. and you take the mare, yeah. well, what's the hours? Well, that ties in a little bit with the question about oocyte lifespan. I think we've got longer than we used to think, but you're, there are two things come to mind. How, you know, if I look at a mare on Monday and she has a 40 millimeter soft follicle and I look at nine o'clock and I look at that mare Tuesday at nine o'clock and she's ovulated, I actually don't know whether she ovulated five minutes after she walked out the crush or five minutes before she came in. We can make a guess, we can think when she ovulated, but we don't know. And that, I think, is the risk with, if, say, on the Tuesday, that mare has a fresh ovulation or what looks like a fresh ovulation, and you, you find out, oh, the stallion is available this afternoon. If, if she truly did just ovulate an hour or two before she came in, then that may well be fertile. But if she ovulated, you know, 8 o'clock the previous evening, well, then you're talking about a 16, 18 hour from ovulation. And I think the difficulty is you don't know. Uh, if you're being truthful, you only know when you look. If you have a 24-hour interval, you don't know within that exactly where the mare ovulates. So it, become, it would have to be... It's an unusual set of circumstances where I would think, right, let's whip this mare off and get her covered. No, we're wondering if Doppler will help with that. One of, one of our guys is very keen on looking at luteal function and trying to assess from the blood flow uh, whether, ju just how good, how, how, how aging it is. We, we, you know, we try and do it, but we, 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 we like to see if they're very obvious. We tend to think there must be 12 hours plus, but in truth, we don't know, and we're wondering if blood flow will help with that, uh, Pippa, really. So we've ran through this, really. Size is important. Uh, up until, you know, really to decide when to give your ovulation induction agent. It's not an indicator uh, of, of exactly within that 36-hour period when she's going to ovulate. We use these other little features, don't we? And, and you know, follicle is useful uh, when it's spherical. But above 40... It's, it's, it's less useful, isn't it? I mean, hey ho, it's four centimeter plus. Once it's got a four centimeters, it's, it's imminent to ovulate, and I'm using other things. What about that follicle? I mean, I think that follicle's normally enough. It, it's just going to start to get a little bit uh, worrying me. Ovulation usually occurs in the thoroughbred as a follicle. It gets up to around about 38, 40 millimeters. It's rare below 35, isn't it? But when people have looked, there is a big range. And it really isn't the most reliable thing. Uh, and we talked about this, uh, you know, this 27 millimeter follicle, which gives us mixed messages. It's small, but other things about it are saying it's close to ovulation. So you pay your money, you take your choice. Ovulation is relatively easy to pick up uh, with a scanner. Here's a mare with multiple, so say day one, two forties on the left ovary. Day two, one of the forties is, is, is ovulated. Very hard to make out. If you at first looked at this mare uh, on, 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 on then, I think very few of us would detect an ovulation in there. 
But if we go back the next day, of course, it's easy enough. And this is what I was meaning. You've got to get very used to looking at number of CLs. Uh, you know, here's a, here's a, there's one, two, and three CLs in these. So this mare has one CL. This mare has two. This mare has three. One there, one there, and one there. So it's very, very important to get used to looking at number of CLs because if you wonder if you're in twins or not, it's a great help to know if there's two CLs. If you only see one CL and you think there's twins, think, think, think very carefully before crushing something. We can get, don't want to get too signed, we can get what we call monozygous twins. Twins can arise from a single ovulation, but it's very, very rare. And fascinating, or I find it fascinating, embryo transfer, there are now about three or four recorded occasions when an embryo has been transferred to a, a, a mare that hasn't been bred at day seven, a single embryo, and that mare turns up twin. That's, that's, that's a fascinating story, I think. So it's a good excuse if you have missed, but I think, I think you're pushing it a little bit. But. And so we're going to go on to talk about an abnormal CL, an ovulation failure. The difficulty we have is that there are so many different appearances of the normal CL. Do you remember that case we talked about? I, would, I, I never got a scan picture from that mare, but I bet she would have, uh, that mare would have a, a very thin board of luteal tissue with a, with a big black central bit, a lacuna we call it, and, and it looks to all intents and purposes like, like a follicle. A little bit, say, say a little bit like that one, but even with less, less, less particles in it. And we got Pat McHugh to write, to write our chapter on, on ovulation failure in, in that green book uh, uh, me, Sampra McKinnon wrote, and we found that Pat in there says 8% of cycles. I think that now, and, and I know he does, that's probably nearer 10% now. So, uh, you know, if you deal with, with 10 mares, uh, on one out of 10 cycles is going to have an abnormal ovulation. So it's very important for us to be able to recognize them. And the vast majority form these hemorrhagic anovulatory follicles, which fill with blood, and hormonally behave like a CL, okay? Hormonally they behave like a CL. So the mare goes out of estrus if you're teasing her, cervix becomes closed, edema pattern disappears. To all intents and purposes, they behave hormonally like she ovulated. They're infertile because the oocyte wasn't released. And the other 15% form these structures we've been talking about. These, uh, they don't luteinize, they form a persistent anovulatory structure. So the difficulty is prostaglandin isn't going to work in those, is it? Why, why, should, why would it? So uh, the va let's, let's stick with the vast majority, the 85% of these structures that form uh, Luteal, you know, they hemorrhage into the structures. Now on the left, I think we'd probably all agree. I mean, I put these up as a, what do you think? I think the one on the left, I mean, 7.6 to the bottom, it's about 40, 42 millimeters. Yeah, there's some little, we can see a little bit of degree of particulate matter there, but I'm quite happy with that follicle. I think that's a follicle very, very close to ovulation. What do you think about, and we showed this earlier, they're the grey hair, what about that? They, you can go to those the next day and the sort of, the number of, 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 of particles has decreased. But, you know, I just think that's too widespread, isn't it? But it's, it's hard to know for sure, isn't it? Hard to know whether that's normal or abnormal. And some of them look really strange, don't they, you know? really strange. And I think that's why uh, GTC is just a granulosa cell tumor and a ovarian tumor. And a lot of times people have been, not so much now because we've got a very good blood test for a, a granulosa cell tumor. But I think in the past way too many ovaries uh, were removed that were perfectly normal because they do look incredibly strange. But that actually, uh, 
that Mary is, is, is not, that hasn't got a tumor. That's just an abnormal ovulation. And, and if you wait a few days and give that mare a dose of prostaglandin, that'll, that'll I mean, it'll take longer to disappear because they're just physically a quite a large structure. But, but you don't have to go removing that mare's ovary. That, on the other hand, that is a, that is a, the, that, that mare had a granulosa cell tumor. You know, look at that thing. That, is that a tumor? Is it, a, what is that thing? You know, it's nearly 10, eight or nine centimeters. So I think the recognition of an anovulatory folly, it's easy with that, we know, that, that's gone beyond. It, it's your, but there's a gradation, isn't there? We're saying on the one hand, echogenic particles at the bottom of the follicle are quite a good indicator the mare's close, so you're going to feel quite happy getting her covered because she's going to ovulate within 24, 36 hours. But if they become too many, whew, then we've shifted into abnormal. But I don't think we can be, other people are, bit more dogmatic, they say, that is an anovulatory follicle. I think you have to be quite careful in deciding. Pick the outliers, they're obvious, but others are much more subtle. So, treatment. If they've luteinized hemorrhagic follicles. So I used to say, this is what I used to do, I used to say, well, wait seven days, and then I'll give the full dose of prostaglandin on two successive days. Because I had the idea that these structures were more difficult to get rid of. And I, I, we began to think, I'm just not so sure that's a good idea. You know, what if you've bred that mare? Does anyone breed a mare, think she's formed a hemorrhagic follicle and then prostaglandin at day seven? I think you're brave. Most of our stud managers wouldn't actually let me do that if I wanted to. They, they, and I think quite wisely, if you've got the mare covered, even if you think she's had an abnormal ovulation, we, we just make a note in the mare record that, that the stud guys have put blood follicle, they call them. Uh, so we're sort of sowing the seed she may not have conceived. But we wouldn't prostaglandin that mare. And I think there's actually another reason. You know, guys, we've said 40% of mares multiple ovulate. And to me, you know, uh, I, you've got hooked up on following this big thing. You might just miss a little sneaky 30, 35 millimeter follicle on the other ovary. And especially with natural covering, that goes on to ovulate three or four days later. And she'll conceive to that one. So I think whichever ways you look at it, if you bred a mare, I'd never ever prostaglandin her at day seven. I'd just let her run through to, to, to a normal time for scanning. Because I'm not sure we can be absolutely certain they have ovulated anyway. These ones, these 15% are the more problematical ones because uh, they haven't luteinized. So clearly, if, the, if they haven't luteinized, there's no point giving them prostaglandin. We, I've tried giving them HCG, I've tried giving them desilorelin. Sometimes I've given them a course, you know, we talked about this when we sometimes do it with prostaglandin. It can sometimes, uh, at 12, 10, 12, 10, 12, it doesn't matter, day course of Altrenagest, Regumate, whatever you want, or Progesterone, if you've got that available. It's often quite a good thing to just settle, you know, it mimics what's happening normally, and it just it's a bit, gives, it takes a bit of time, but it does sort of settle that mare down, for want of a, a, a better word. They will spontaneously regress, but, but it, can, these, it can take a long time for these to go. And as I say, just occasionally, we, we have a device we use you know, we developed it for oocyte recovery on the, on the non-thoroughbred world where we do uh, harvest oocytes and put them in a recipient. Uh, but we can also do it for uh, puncturing one of a twin and we can also just very occasionally, I just physically have reduced the size of this thing because it was, we were just fed up of the thing sitting there and sitting there. And, and we touched on this really, certain mares have a high uh, risk incidence, age, it might be common in older mares. And again, this is, we, we, did, we, we mentioned this as well, if you go giving too much prostaglandin to mares, I, I think far from being a, a, a treatment as it were for a hemorrhagic follicle, I think you can end up causing them in these mares. And there is quite established evidence now for prostaglandin uh, in itself per se, causing an increase in these hemorrhagic follicles. So if I have a mare which seems to repeatedly form them, 
I'll certainly try and use the very, very lowest dose possible. Uh, I certainly would avoid that. I mean, it isn't really high, is it? We've been saying it's normal doses. And, you know, you've got to be very careful. If you use Corillon, I think, too early in these mares, you'll, you'll, you'll again have a tendency to cause a hemorrhagic follicle. So, I don't know. I th do you think that's normal or not? That f I think that's abnormal. I think that's going to form a hemorrhagic follicle, that. I'm trying to just bang it a bit to see how... If it had been four and a half centimetres size instead of six and a half, seven, I'd have been less bothered. This was quite interesting. I mean, this is two types of CL on the same ovary, look. See, what's that? That's, that, that? That was a hemorrhagic follicle. And that's a granulosis cell tumor. They're very difficult to tell apart. We're quite lucky now there's a, there's a hormone test we can use in the UK, and I'm sure it won't be long before it comes here. I don't think AMH isn't here yet, Ian, is it? No. It only, we, we got it only about a year ago. Uh, we used to measure. Can you measure inhibin? Inhibin isn't quite as good a marker even as anti-malarian hormone. So, hemorrhagic follicles, and, and, and remember, we just said at the back of your mind, keep those endometrial cups. That's another view of those endometrial cups, look, on, on, on endoscope. And they're very rare to see on ultrasound. And, and the, the, the mares, uh, the two mares for that series where we, in, or, or it's hardly a series, really, where we infused that kerosene, we, we sort of did that blind. We were just trying it because we guessed they must have a, endometrial cup. I don't know why you see them in some mares on scope and others you don't. And it's incredibly rare to be able to image them on ultrasound. So I'm not, I'm not saying uh, you see this very often, but, but I, I don't know why you see it in some mares and not, not others. Uh, the uterus, endometrial cysts. I mean, you know, I don't know what your view is over here, but the jury's pretty much out on these things. You know, we all know mares which seem to have more cysts than uterus, and they, they carry a foal quite happily to term. Well, what's the feeling here about mares with endometrial cysts? Yeah. We bought an expensive laser, so we started lasering, but I felt really I was being a... I, I, my heart wasn't in it, really. I'm, I'm, we had a mare which, which he had more, more uterus... Uh, M more cyst than uterus, and she seemed to... That, that, I think, is the most relevant. I, I, think, that, I think that's... Well, vets just complain, but, or I do. I've noticed the whinger, but I, I think that actually... That's my feeling, is the most important thing of cysts, is, is, is mixing them up with a, yeah, but a if pregnancy. You, if you've got... I've got a record. I've got two mares with cysts, and I've got a record of where they are and how big they are. So yeah, they generally stay pretty much the same throughout the cycle of the season, as long as they're not. Some of them, and I already knew this when I, when we began scoping mares. I, I would I would do exactly the same. We record the cyst, and I have it base of the left horn. There's an 18 millimeter, uh, perfectly spherical cyst. And then I, I'd, I'd, I'd and luckily it was before we'd covered the mare, scanned it. Then you know a week later or whatever for some reason, they're this things. Uh, base of the, uh, the other horn. I think, well, hell, I must have made a mistake in the notes. But wh when I've scoped a few mares, some cysts are on quite a long stalk, and I think they can move a little bit. So I agree, very important to map them out. 19 times out of 20, they don't move. But just don't absolutely say for sure they never move. Yes, uh, of course, very tight time, but that's a good way of making, yeah. As long as you're doing your first preg scan early enough, which is a good reason why we like to do them 14, 15 days, because if we're not sure, cyst or twin, we can wait a day or possibly even two days. If you don't do your first scan until 16, 17, I think it's a little bit uh, risky. Uh, I must have thought this was, I don't know if many, endoscopy is a good thing to do in mares. And, and, and there's a mare with, with a uterine adhesion. And 
We can, you'd think you would see some of those with ultrasound, but you tend not to. Uh, and we scope quite a lot of mares, and we now found it much easier than we used to. This is, this is a few years ago when I was in Holland, or 20 years ago probably. You can see the guy helping me doesn't even have his hand in the vagina of the mare. He's not directing the scope at all. And it's much more difficult for me to get them up the left or the right you try and horn. When we do them now, the guy helping me is much more dynamic. You see, he's got his arm inside and he's directing it almost directing it up left or right horn because you've only got limited movement on the end of the scope. Video endoscope is better, but if you haven't got one, it is worth using just your ordinary scope in them. And that's what we're looking for. If you get up the left and right, that's the oviductal papilla. That's where the oviduct comes into the uterus of the mare, at the tip of the left and right horn. And it projects forward, you know, two or three millimeters. Because fertilization happens in the oviduct. It stays up there in the mercurity for five and a half days. That's why we can lavage. I don't like lavaging more than two days after ovulation. I try and lavage before ovulation. But you're not going to flush the, uh, the embryo out. The embryo doesn't come down in the uterus till about day five and a half, day six. It's sitting up in the oviduct. And the entrance of the oviduct in is, is this little structure which we can see very clearly on endoscopy and if I can get up the left and the right horn I see this papilla well I know everything's okay what is it lunchtime guys gosh we've gone to lunch yes we were talking about using an endoscope and and I don't know uh, I don't know how many of mares get endoscope but it's something we, we, we're quite keen to do uh, a lot of and particularly for adhesions and this was a very expensive dressage mare as it happened that was uh, had been empty, barren for two or three years, and apparently she'd fold in uh, in Germany was all I knew, uh, and I thought, well, we'll scope the mare and see what we can see, and I, I scoped there. That's looking into the right uterine horn, and I thought, well, yeah, okay, there's there's a couple of adhesions here, but that doesn't look anything too bad. And then, yeah, look what we saw when I scoped that mare's, trying to get in the left uterine horn of that mare. I mean, I, I totally scarred over, hey? And that's from putting a, a, a betadine infusion into a mare. So I, I would be very careful uh, if you want to do that, really. I can, they can follow an obstetric injury if the mare has a severe... Uh, uterine inflammation, but I think the main cause, in my experience, of these severe, severe adhesions is infusion of, of, of too concentrated a betadine or an iodine solution. And you know, they effectively end a mare's career. We'll talk about what's career ending for a mare uh, in a bit, but they may end a mare's career. We actually laser them, uh, but I didn't dare laser. I, I couldn't see where normal uterus. Uh, sort of began, I, I just didn't know where to, where to burn in this mare, really. And I was too worried about going through a uterus into the, into the peritoneum. So I, I said, it's over, I, I, there's nothing I can do with this mare. Um, so I don't know, I left this in, I think I, must, I went to, I, I got to Brazil quite a bit, so I must have been, I don't know, when, when the footy was on, I think, and the guy had a, I don't know why the guy had a watermelon on his head, but... Uh, <laughs> No, no, good Lord, no, <laughs> crikey. Uh, fluid, and we're just going to talk a little bit about fluid. Uh, the difficulty is everybody always wants to be told exactly how you manage these mares, and, and we, we know it doesn't work like that because a, a lot of papers and books write about a mare either being able to be covered and get no fluid, or she gets fluid. Uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a scale, isn't it? It's a degree. Uh, you know, it isn't a black or white deal. Uh, and, you know, you're in a variety of different situations. Uh, each mare, you know, you might be a long distance from uh, away. You might have a visit, a vet visit once a, a week, once a day, once a fortnight. I don't know. Uh, uh, economics, of course, is important. Uh, so you can't say how you manage your mares at the time of breeding. 
And these, I guess, are the treatment options which I've used in our practice and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit just now. It doesn't mean these other treatments aren't, uh, people have used these for fluid in mares and uh, I, I've, 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 I'm not saying to use them is wrong, I just have a, have a rule, I never talk about something I only read about, I only, I only like talking about something that I use day in, day out, I mean, so I just don't use those, that's all, which isn't the same as saying that they aren't useful in somebody's hands, so it, 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 it's, uh, it's up to you. I, I guess we can call it, uh, the Ameri we tend to call it in England persistent mating induced, mating is just breeding induced endometritis. The Americans, if I'm lecturing, that way, they call it DUC, a delay in uterine clearance. It's the accumulation of fluid. We know it isn't the fluid itself. The fluid itself is needed to uh, get rid of excess sperm. And, you know, I don't want to get too much into AI stuff, but just to give you some figures, a, a, a mare or a stallion at natural covering will typically put in about seven or eight times more sperm uh, than is needed. There's a figure called the insemination dose, which was produced in the... Uh, early 80s when there was a, a, two big field studies looked at in, inseminating mares with 100 million sperm, 200 million, 300 and so on. And they found that once you went above 500 million sperm, no more mares are going to get in foal. So there's no advantage to putting more sperm in than 500 million. And for a long while we thought that, okay, fair enough, but we're just maybe wasting a bit at natural covering. But in fact, the research then which followed through in the 90s showed that sperm themselves induce quite a marked inflammatory response. So not only are we putting excess sperm in uh, at natural covering, we're probably, well, we are running a risk of, of, of inducing a, an inflammatory response. And for most mares, it's not a problem. It doesn't matter you put in excess sperm. But for the mares that pull fluid, it is a problem. And... I don't want to burden you with figures, but something you might find is interesting in the, in, in, in the, in the thoroughbred uh, and stallion breeding is that a ballpark figure is a stallion will produce six or seven billion sperm at each ejaculate. And we've just said once we get to 500 million, there's no advantage. So conservatively, a stallion produces 10 times more sperm than is needed. So that is why if you wonder... You know, I've got a stallion with only one testicle. Even if you take away half his sperm production capacity, he's still giving you four or five times more than is needed at ejaculate. So some of the national hunt, which is jump racing stallions in Ireland, were covering, perhaps not so much nowadays, but certainly back in the mid-2000s when there was a big boom on, covering 350, 400 mares in a season. Oh, and some people say, oh, well, they must be using AI. You know, you couldn't possibly do that without AI. So covering four times a day, uh, seven days a week for uh, six months of a breeding season. Do you think enough sperm will be produced by the stallion? Do you think you'll wear the stallion out for sperm under those conditions? What do you think? No. What, what will be, what is the problem? Why are most stallions not able to do that? It's a libido issue. That's all. So I actually dispute, I, I, I don't think a thoroughbred place in, in UK or Ireland w would embark on AI because, you know, you'll fire the groom the next day and they'll blow the story that you've been collecting semen. And I think some of the non-thoroughbred people think, oh, well, you can't possibly deal with that number of mares. And you can't with many stallions, but it's not because of their sperm output. It's because of a libido issue. Uh, if, if you can persuade them to cover the mare, then it'll be a good... Uh, it, they'll put out enough sperm. So that's just a little bit of an aside. This is, uh, I just want you to have a little think about this, uh, or, or, or maybe it's, uh, times against us a little bit. I'll, I'll pull up ones we've done before for you, because I, I, I mind if we don't want to be too late. So I, I can't remember where I last was talking about this. Uh, how quickly does sperm reach the oviduct site of fertilization? So fertilization, the sperm meets the oocyte in the, in human 
terms, I guess we tend to call it fallopian tube. We conventionally call it uh, the uterine tube or oviduct in the mare, but it's the same thing as a fallopian tube. Uh, it's a little connection, if you will, between the ovary and the uterus. And that's where fertilization happens. Fertilization doesn't happen in the uterus. It happens in the oviduct. So the sperm have to get uh, into the oviduct. And a natural covering, say you the ejaculate gets deposited halfway along the uterus, uh, it gets into the sperm very, very quickly. And these guys here were obviously fairly switched on in the lecture. Uh, the work says they get up there within four hours. If you talk to the folks researching semen movement and sperm transport, they think it may be even quicker than four hours, perhaps two hours. So a natural covering, the sperm, which are going to end up fertilizing the oocyte, are gone probably within two hours, but certainly within four hours. Now, why have I decided to bring that, throw that fact in? Well, I'll tell you, most times, you know, it's already been, we talked about it earlier, I, I, I line up a mare for covering, she gets covered on Tuesday, she gets looked at on Wednesday, the next day we're at the stud farm. And that's fine and dandy for 90% 90, 90 of mares. But what about the mare that's prone to pooling fluid, highly susceptible to en en endometritis or, or, or infection? Well, might it be better if we dealt with that mare before the infection, the inflammation, had time to build up? And there's no doubt we are better to do it in those mares. We cannot do it as a routine because it would stuff our day up if we had to arrange to look at all mares four to six hours after covering. Because, you know, say you'd booked your covering slot for two o'clock Tuesday afternoon, it's quite awkward logistically to have to go back at seven, eight o'clock, mobilize everybody to deal with that mare. So we're not going to do it on any sort of routine basis. But if you're struggling with a mare uh, or you think she's at, at an enormous risk for pooling fluid, then it can be something that might be helpful for you. But you can only do it if you're able to, uh, you know, because if your mare is that serious at pooling fluid, you're probably going to be doing a lavage. And there's no point doing a lavage if you're going to flush all the semen out. So you do need to know this figure. And although I agree with the, 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 whoever, the delegates here who, who polled the answer then, that it probably is below four hours. Our practice and most practices stick at four hours as the minimum. We w I will not lavage a mare within four hours of covering because I'm too nervous that I, I, I'll offset the reduction in, I can, I, or, 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 the, or the fluid accumulation I can help. I'm too worried I'll flush sperm out. I may not be correct in that, but I think let's leave it till four hours. But certainly in those highly problem mares, mares that you're struggling with, mares that by the time you come the next day after covering, they've got two, three, four centimeters of depth in fluid. Maybe uh, try and get those mares treated four to six hours after breeding them. And it, it's the fact that this fluid persists is a problem. And, and I tried to illustrate it here. If you think about fluid accumulating in a mare, I used to wonder if it was excessive fluid production. So years ago when I was doing a PhD, I thought, well, I wonder what a litre of saline put into a mare's uterus looks like on scan, you know? So I thought we, we used to have four sets of stocks where we could have these research pony mares I was with, and I put four in and I, I, I put a litre of, of, of saline into them, uh, started at one end and ended at the other, and probably no more, the mares were all in estrus and were all normal mares. And probably no more than 20, 25 minutes from putting the first bag into the first mare to the uh, uh, first bag into the fourth mare. So I goes back 20 minutes later to try and scan the first mare to see what the fluid looks like. It's all come out. Nothing to see. Second mare, nothing to see. Third, nothing to see. Fourth, nothing to see. So at the time, I thought, well, what a waste of a morning or whatever that had been. Uh, but in actual fact, it's, it's the piece of information I used to, to, 
to knock back the idea that, that, that some repro colleagues of mine think that it's an excessive fluid production. I, I, I don't buy into that. I think uh, the mayor ha has a tremendous ability uh, to drain fluid, and a normal mayor will deal with however much fluid is produced. So I don't think it's an excessive fluid production. I think it's a failure to drain the fluid. And the difficulty is, uh, it isn't down to just one thing. So it isn't just that the uterus, it's a big part of it that the uterus can't, can't squeeze the fluid out. And, and you know, as, as, as Helen was kind enough to say, we, 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 we were certainly one of the first, it's always safer to say, but we, who wrote this idea up. And we were, you forget now, it's all taken in the, the literature thing to do. We had so much flack, we were laughed at almost when we said, oh, well, let's use oxytocin in these mares. Or we were told they'll all get colic afterwards. Oh, you can't use oxytocin for this fluid. Uh, so I, I clearly am an enormous enthusiast of oxytocin in mares for fluid. But it isn't the only answer. It'll help with the mares where they're suffering from a reduced myometrial contraction. But some mares have what we call insufficient lymphatic drainage. They're the mares, you know, when we were grading edema, that have that... Heavy isn't really quite the word, but it's intense or whatever. That very, very marked, almost off your scale of edema pattern. Those mares are very, very pl prone uh, to accumulating fluid because they have insufficient lymphatic drainage of it. So oxytocin isn't particularly helpful in those mares. If you simply have a 15, 16 year old mare who's had a ton of foals and perhaps the odd little bit of a dystochia and she just has a large pendulous uterus, well, it's a very big ask for the oxytocin to push that fluid up and, and drain it out. And then you don't see it so much in the thoroughbred world because, you know, I don't know what it is in, 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 in South Africa, but in the UK, by and large, a filly. I'll, I'll race till she's maybe three or four, possibly five, very rarely longer, but by and large, relatively young age, three or four, and then she'll go to stud, and the aim is she'll have a foal every, every, every year until she can't or, or she doesn't one year. But that's very different to these, the sports horse breeding world. We'll often get presented with a mare at 16, 17 years old. That's never had a foal before. And a tremendous problem we face with those is, is the cervix of those mares has got old and got scarred up. And if you put any amount of uh, sperm in there, they'll produce a huge amount of fluid behind that. So uh, in those mares, oxytocin alone is not going to be enough. You're going to have to do something with the cervix of the mare. But certainly mid to late teenage thoroughbred mares may well have a cervix problem. And you're going to have to pay attention to that as well as giving them your oxytocin. So if I had to sort of try and summarize what I think your best chance is for dealing with these problem fluid accumulating mares, it would be, uh, don't forget the bigger picture. You know, it's no good giving mares oxytocin, treating them afterwards, lavaging them afterwards, if she's got uh, poor vulval conformation. Like everything we do in mares, we may end up uh, stitching more mares than we should. I, I, I think it's, it's a little bit unavoidable. Uh, I try and do it as scientifically as I can, but I mean, we all know if a mare's failing to conceive, it, it's a little bit of a, a, a temptation is to put a caslic in. Uh, what percentage of thoroughbred mares will be caslic in, in, in South Africa? 20%. 20%. Yeah, I think it'd be about 20. I'd like to think, and I say like, because I do think it's something not to overdo. Do we think more or? 50%. Yeah. France, yeah, France is around about 100%, I think. Ireland, it's pretty near 100%. Too tight. Yeah. Yes. Ah, now that's a that's a favourite topic of mine. I, I 
you may, May's may be getting overstitched, but I, at least I like to think with mine, I remove, I may not even remove tissue sometimes. I may just, with a scalpel, make that U-shape bleed and stitch it together. Too many people uh, remove like a centimeter thickness of, of, of not only the mucosa, which is the inner part of the bowl, they remove the skin of that mare. And that's a, that's a horrendous thing to do because uh, in the end, you'll run out of, of, of vulva to stitch together. And I've had mid-teenage mares that have had a bad caslic done open and closed, open and closed. In the end, you, you can hardly, they've almost stuffed that mare, really. You, sh you only need to make a very uh, thin flap of skin. Or you even, sometimes I just make, I, I just get the area to bleed. I don't even remove any tissue at all. Yes, yeah. Is that all? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've never... I'm, I'm, I, I, yes, yeah. I, I, it's w Not many race fillies are caslicked in the UK, actually. Great time of breeding. We've talked about this, really. We've moved away. From, every time you cover a mare, you're putting more semen in. You're, you're exposing that mare to endometritis. So... I really think it's important to, to cover a mare once only. And we haven't really talked about this, and I think the jury's out a little bit on, on what do you do with a mare that produces fluid before breeding. You know, I'm, I'm reluctant. I certainly don't like putting antibiotics in the uterus of a mare before breeding. And uh, I would like to get rid of that, any fluid pre-breeding with just oxytocin, I would like to keep out of that mare's uterus. Uh, so if we see fluid before breeding, we'll uh, use oxytocin to try and get rid of it. If it's, if it's above half a centimetre, half a, not to half a centimetre, especially if it's going for natural covering. And as long as we've had a swab to make sure it's nothing nasty, we'd be happy enough about it. And then rapidly, and you can decide what rapidly is, you know, in most situations, uh, we, we look at the mare the next day and we do treat the mare in relation to uh, in relation to breeding we don't wait around for ovulation I'd much sooner interfere in the uterus while she's under estrogen dominance before she's ovulated and that's an option open to us with natural cover not an option open to us with frozen semen and be clean. I mean, it's a small thing, but if these are susceptible mares, uh, you know, be as hygienic as possible, really, before breeding. Did it? No, that's a that's an AI technician friend of mine from a little bit. Is that good or bad, Jez? I don't know. We'll leave. Who knows? You just take it. Take it as gone. And. You know, everybody wants to say, right, well, John, we've got a fluid in it. How do we, how do we treat it? And, and I said to you, unfortunately, we can't do this. There isn't a recipe because each mare's a little bit different. One mare, a bit of oxytocin might be enough given uh, the day after breeding. Another mare, you may have to go back and lavage four hours after covering. You know, you've got to make a decision where along that scale of, of, of susceptibility you're going to put it. I used to, I think I'll have to change these slides. I used to put with shades of grey, but everybody thinks shades of grey is something else these days. So, so I, <laughs> I wonder if I ought to, I ought to change that. Yeah, I suppose I was, yes. They didn't seem to want me for the role, so. Uh, so don't worry about this, but I just want to know, can you, do, do you all use, what do you use in a thoroughbred, 15 units? Uh, one and a half, I think. I'm sure you'll have the same strength. Ten units per mil. One and a half. I used to, and probably I was, I was using two. I, I've slightly, it's been a little bit shown that you may get a, a, a sort of spasm at certain doses. So uh, I've dropped it. I, I don't think it would matter. I think 20 is, I certainly wouldn't go above two cc's. And, and I, I, I have more or less in the thoroughbred would give one and a half mils. We may give it three, four times in a day, but, but generally 15 units. And, and that was pretty much, uh, yeah, I, I don't think tens, I, I, I think they're, it's a little bit risky, I think, uh, to go much below 15. 
don't worry about this. Uh, I really only mention it because it was a group of us who, who invented or not invented it, found it out, I suppose. <laughs> Most veterinarians are aware, they guess, well, the, the half-life. The half-life is, is, is uh, the time which a drug is effective for, really. Uh, and then is, is, is below a level that's of, of any sort of effect. And most colleagues would guess that the half-life is short in the mare. Uh, but a lot didn't know exactly uh, how long it is. And it's actually 6.8 minutes. So it's very, very short. Uh, yeah, got it, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, it was, I don't know who, it, it's a friend of mine looked at that. Um, could we do an intrauterine infusion of oxytocin? And I'm guessing from the fact that it never seemed to take off, is it, and, and it's not something I, I felt it was perfectly effective given intravenously or, or, or intramuscularly. It actually doesn't make much difference. So I didn't use it. Yes, okay, I mean, prostaglandin, uh, I'm, I'm too nervous, I think prostaglandin is a very good agent at, at contracting the uterus and, and, and gives a slightly more prolonged effect, but I'd be very, very nervous to use it around the time of ovulation. If you're getting the mare covered maybe a day or two ahead, then I think it's fine. The evidence seems to suggest that if you give it too closely, certainly any time after ovulation, because of what we've been finding about the, the dose of prostaglandin really historically being way too high, it will affect luteal function as early as day nor to day one. So I looked at that for a while and what I went back to doing was just maybe giving four or five doses of oxytocin. It's a relatively cheap drug. I, it, it's very well tolerated. You can give it in a little tiny 20 gauge needle. It's a small dose. So we just got people to give more frequent dosing because at one point I was very interested in a long-acting oxytocin, but that didn't really seem to give us much improvement. So, I don't know, I certainly know colleagues who, who, who are very enthusiastic about using prostaglandin, and that's absolutely fine. I've just gone down the road of using a, a, a multiple doses of, of oxytocin. Corticosteroids, I don't know, is anyone, has anyone seen corticos used in these mares? If we gave 98 doses of oxytocin, say, we might give two doses of corticosteroid. So that gives you some sort of, uh, it's always important when you're talking about something to give incidence levels or, or, or numbers idea. So it's relatively slow, but, and we use it when we've got these mares with that really, I don't know whether you're going to call it heavy or marked or intense, whatever you're going to call it. You know, that really heavy looking uterine edema pattern. And the paper came out, uh, I think, 2008 or 2009, 2008. Steph, Steph Booker looked at it, and, and she said to give 50 milligrams. I just think, I, always, I thought that was just a little bit of a big dose, and I, 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 I think thoroughbreds aren't really at risk for uh, laminitis post corticosteroids. It's, it's another story whether any horse is at risk for laminitis post steroids. But... I felt uh, we, had, we took a practice decision that we'd just knock that dose down a little bit. So we used the typical systemic dose, uh, a, a short-acting de dexamethasone, and, and we give 40 milligrams, which, which at our concentration, I mean, always check concentrations, is 20 ml. And we tend to give it at the time of breeding. I can't see much point in leaving it till 12 hours. I mean, the whole point is to try and damp down the inflammation developing, so I couldn't really see the point in, in waiting. Uh, and, and the oral preps, which, which have been looked at, they do seem effective, but they struck me as a lot more of a faff, of a fiddle. Uh, so we tend to give, but I, I've, I've, I've left it wrong there, we give 40 milligrams, uh, and we don't, that was, that was Steph's paper, 12 to 24, we decided we'd give it at the time of breeding. So we'll, we'll, with these mares, we'd, we'd, we'd literally give them the injection of dexamethasone and they'd go around and get covered. And, and give it, we tend to give it intravenously. If you can give it an injection IV in the horse, I always think it's better. 
although we don't seem to get much issue with intraven uh, intramuscular dex dexamethasone. We're big on flushing mares, and if you get organized, it really doesn't take that long. We tend to use the old embryo transfer tubes, the cuff catheters, but I know many, many colleagues are quite happy to just put it in with a stomach tube without a cuff. You just tend to get uh, a sort of wet arm where it runs down, and, and that may have more significance in England, where it's about two degrees. It may be quite welcome here, so I'm, I'm sure if I developed my skills over here, I'd probably be quite happy to use a, a non-cuff tube. But we tend to use a cuff tube in the UK because it locks nicely in uh, to the uterus. And we'll use either warm ringers, but saline's perfectly okay. People often ask, I mean, I've put there two to three litres, but you really use, I only ever put it in one litre at a time. If you put much more, you know, in a typical thoroughbred, if you start putting in much more than a litre, she'll get a little bit spicy. So I think you're best to put in a litre at a time uh, and then flush it out. And you, you use however many it takes until it comes back clear. Uh, if you put the first litre in and, and you, you flush it back out, or, or, or I mean, I do an in-out system. I don't leave it in there. I put it in and bring it out. Uh, if it comes back uh, clear, well, there's no point putting any more in. But if it's cloudy, you might you need to put another litre in. If it's still cloudy, another litre. And... This is, I often get colleagues say, well, well hang on, well, why don't you want the, the fluid to stay in there? I've, it's just been my, I've always done it this way, I've always given them the oxytocin at the front, then gone round and, and done the lavage, because all I'm wanting, or my theory is, that I'm thinking we just want to rinse the uterus. We don't need the fluid to sit in there. So, uh, I, some people are often surprised when I say that I give oxytocin at the time I give the give the fluid. Uh, do many, many of you flush mares? And do you give oxytocin at the time? Or? Yeah. Hmm. I, I don't know. I don't think it probably matters one way or the other. But, but that, my feeling was I would give it the time because I wanted to rinse it through and then I want to try and make sure I've none left. And I just find those cuff tubes a little bit neater. You can pull them back against the, this would be the internal opening of the cervix here where the cuff is. And it just is a, it's less likely to leak out, but, but it, it doesn't matter really. Or you do have to be quite fussy with them. You know, in theory, by definition, if you're going to flush a mare, you must have made a decision. She's, she's to some extent susceptible to pooling fluid. Yeah. Go Sorry, that's yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a good point, really. Uh, I, I, my routine for a flush, which, and, and of course, any mare that's getting a flush with me, but I think the younger guys in the practice are changing. I mean, I'm a bit of a dinosaur with antibiotics as we chatted about the break, but I might as well tell you what I do. My system was to, they're in the crush, uh, we, I've scanned them, I've seen more than two centimeters of fluid, so bang, right, this mare is going to get a lavage. Uh, is I'll go in, I'll give her the 15 units of, of, of oxytocin IV, go and get the bag of fluid out, uh, or, or however many bags we're going to need, we'll get it cleaned up, I'll put the bag in, take it out, put it in, take it out. And I think by then, it's probably going to, even though we think we're quite quick, I mean, it's going to be 10 minutes by she's had the oxytocin. And the evidence is we're beyond the half-life for that anyway, so uh, it's sort of gone out of a system. So I'm then quite happy by the time I finish, I'll put the antibiotics in there and then. So I'm not too worried about uh, uh, having had the oxytocin too closely related to the antibiotics, because I think as long as you've gone 10 minutes, the, the oxytocin is only a bit high, and especially if you've only given 15 units, it's going to be pretty much beyond its, its, its useful dose left in the mare anyways. So it's a good, good point. So be careful with them. Uh, yeah, and that, that's, that's, that's really a summary of what, what we've talked about there. We do it with, with a gravity flow. We just lower it down, collect it. And, you know, if, if you get the first bag like that, well, you're going to have to put in a second litre, aren't you? And even that looks a little bit cloudy. Third, I don't know. I obviously thought I put five through in here. It look, look, looked as if it was fairly clear by there, but, you know, whatever's. But one litre at a time, I don't think, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I find mares get a little bit uncomfortable with more than, and it distributes well, I promise you, a litre 
in, it would be a heck of a uterus that didn't, a litre didn't, didn't distribute well. And flush it until clear fluid comes back. And, you know, they are problem mares, so I think you've got to be fussy, all in, all out. So we sometimes, if, I, if I'm th thinking recovery's been bad, I will flush them. Because we tend to recover it in the bag, uh, I have a bit of an idea whether we've got enough fluid back in or not, really. Now, the old story of, of, of antibiotics, and, and I, I talked about this in Holland, and I, I think I was lucky to escape with my life there. Uh, the, the Europe has a tremendous thing about over by, uh, use of antibiotics, and there's no doubt as veterinarians we're feeling pressure about it, or, or as breeders, whatever, whatever we are, forget who we are now. Uh, and, and I don't want in any way to be irresponsible about using antibiotics, but to, to my way of thinking, it, it's these, you know, the, the swine and, 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 and poultry industry which are feeding shed loads of these things into, you know, meat producing animals. I cannot believe we do it as a single infusion and on a one off basis, and we use. I've got two things. This is a water-soluble combination, which I, I try to encourage everyone to use, but our, our Aussie fellows think it takes too long, so they use just a solution of depicillin. But either way, it's penicillin. And, and that really isn't much used, in, in, certainly not in human medicine. I mean, they reckon a lot of things are resistant to straightforward benzyl penicillin. So I, I, I don't think that amount... Uh, would be a problem. And this is what I, I tried to do. Uh, but in the end, I, I fell into the trap of what those guys were getting just as good a results with a much easier way, the six and six thing. So I have to say that uh, Newmarket told me that they didn't like the idea of a suspension in the uterus. So I sort of followed that for a long while and thought I'd better go along with trying to use a, a solution, crystalline penicillin and framomycin. In theory, the penicillin is effective against gram-positive bacteria and the aminoglycoside type antibiotic is effective against the gram-negative. So streptococci would be a gram-positive bacteria and E. coli would be a, a gram-negative. And, you, you know, post-breeding, we don't know what bacteria are in there. It may be a mixture. Uh, so I felt we, had it, we needed a gram positive and a gram negative, but, you know, I, I don't... Uh, strep is a commonist, so, you know, maybe you could just use a gram positive. But our, our colleagues, uh, they, they wanted to just use six mils of, of procaine penicillin. And, and now we can't get framomycin, so we use gentamicin. Uh, we just occasionally check how well buffered it is, uh, because we don't want it to be irritant to the uterus. Uh, and, and if, if money was no object, we used a gram of keftiofure, XNL, it's called in the UK. That, that's particularly effective against anaerobes, and we tend to ignore anaerobes in, uh, in equine reproduction. We do it once only. So, I don't know about uterine antibiotics. I, I, I think, I, having, you know, I was chatting it through to uh, one or two of you during the day. I, I, I'm sure I'm a little bit of a dinosaur in that I learned doing it this way. I, I've had a moderate degree of success with getting mares in foal. So, you know, I, I, I'm not going to change my system. But, but I'm, I, I think if I was starting off now, I would see if we could lavage just and oxytocin just, and I would try and use less antibiotics. Yes, neomycin's okay. I mean, it's a, it's a suspension, but, but, but I'm not too worried about that. But I just probably would only use 10 mils. I think 20 mils would be too big a dose. I don't know what, what, what's getting used over here. Which one? Are they? And neomycin. And neomycin. Yeah, neopen's quite good. And funny enough, the last few years we've revisited systemic antibiotics. Uh, yeah, sorry. The volume of the is 60 mils. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
the, the uterus really is a potential space. And, and when we were wondering what things look like, I wondered what a suspension of penicillin looked like. And I put six mils of, of depicillin into the body of the uterus. And very, very quickly, I could see this intensely echogenic thing right up the tip of both horns, coating it. So I, I seem to think it seems to coat it. Well, I don't think a normal uterus, I mean, I guess you mean surface area, really, because, uh, you know, and I think it just needs to travel up it. I think it travels up it very quickly. How much it coats it, I don't know. Uh, but I think... Yes. No, no, by contact, I guess. So... Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people liked a bigger volume, uh, and I suppose I wanted to try and encourage them to use a bigger volume, but they wouldn't do, and their result, you know, the nice thing of repro work is if, if we're getting, if our per cycle pregnancy rates drop, we're very soon going to know about it. And in an anecdotal way, that six and six seem to maintain just the same results. But I agree with you, you could wonder if it's enough to to coat it all, because it has to be a coating. It's not, a, it's not an absorption at the endometrium. The only thing, that occasionally I will go to a systemic antibiotic, and that, then I guess it is a different system. That's relying on it going into, uh, into the tissue. And I use systemic antibiotics with these sort of mares, where I think there's a limit to the amount you can caslic those mares. Uh, I mean, if you caslic that mare down to there, which is probably where the level of the pelvis is, I mean, I'd have thought she's just going to retain urine. So with these mares, I stitch them as low down as I can, and then for the first five days, they'll go on oral TMPS. But to give you some sort of numbers, I mean, if it's probably one or two percent, you know, one or two in a hundred mares will get a systemic antibiotic dose. But, you know, I think it's quite nice. It, it saves you going into the uterus in the... Uh, in the luteal phase. And I don't want to bore you with, but we got, we, for years we've had so much stick about this antibiotic story that I did try and, 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 and do a, a trial on it. The difficulty is in that people don't send mares to our stud farms to have trials done on them. They, they send them there to get put in foal. So if, if I felt it benefited a mare to get antibiotics, it was very hard it, it, when I set up this, but I said I'd do it for one cycle and one cycle only in, in, uh, in 380 mares. And we had groups, we had a control group that weren't given anything. Uh, we had group B, which was given antibiotic infusion only. Uh, uh, group C were given oxytocin only, and then the end group was given the combo. And I mean, what does that tell you? It tells you that, 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 that you get an increase in, and, and this was a level of significance. So these were significantly higher than this, and this was significantly higher than all of them. So the point is, though, 57% of these mares were going to go in foal at that site without anything in the uterus, without any oxytocin in the uterus. And the, the, the struggle we always have is to identify the mares which, which need it. I won't show you all the slides, but if I, if I split our mare population into below 12 and above 12, as I did, you can, you can maybe guess what happens. In the below 12 age group, we narrowed all the difference between these because we shoved this up. We saw less benefit there. So you could argue, if you wanted to bring some science into it, uh, perhaps you only treated mares over the age of 12. Maybe you only treat mares with fluid. You can do all those things if you want, and I think there's a good deal of science to that. But there's no point in me saying any other different. I just didn't want to have to w worry about it. You know, that, do you remember back early on this morning, I showed you that picture of that young mare, 25th of February, you might have seen that scan date. That mare was covered on the first day of the season. We'd lined everything up to get the, the, this mare early on in foal. And there you are, she's sitting with pus in the uterus. So I think I came back to the practice and I said, that's it. I'm not listening to these antibiotic people anymore. They're all going to get infused, simple as. And then we don't have to think about it. It's not very scientific, and I may well have a different view today, but 
I took that bit of work I did 20 years ago now to mean, for me, I'm going to put antibiotics in the uterus of the mare. And that's all I can say. So I suppose if we wanted to try and breed your fluidy mares together, try and just breed these mares once. Even if you, you know, you can all, if, if, if there are any doubt, you can give oxytocin uh, every six hours after breeding. If, if you want to do that, if you don't want to see it the ne until the next day, you could at least just, uh, you know, get the study of oxytocin six hours uh, and 12 hours after breeding. Try and look at it most times the next day, don't we? That's when we generally look at mares that have been covered. Give some oxytocin, 15 to 20 units, maybe lavage, maybe corticose. Re-examine to check fluid removed. Uh, 20 minutes, you probably only need to wait 10. I mean, we would take the mare out of the crush, maybe look at another two and have her back in. And I think within 10, 20 minutes, the, the oxytocin's out of the system so we can infuse a low volume of broad spectrum antibiotics. And you can then carry on administering further doses of oxytocin. I repeat treatment is necessary, but I try not to go in to the uterus anymore. So we, we wondered uh, if this was, was better to treat four to six hours after breeding in mares that you had decided were highly problematical. And whatever we're going to treat in relation to breeding, there's no need to wait until ovulation for treating. So we set up very little small trial. I had a Swiss uh, PhD student with me or collecting some clinical data. So uh, we, set, we set up a trial where we had a group of, these were highly susceptible mares, mares we knew were pooling a lot of fluid, not just a half centimetre, maybe two, three, four centimetres. So half of them we said we'd lavage as sort of normal, I suppose, the next day. And then half of them we said, we'll have them four to six hours after insemination. So not big numbers here, look. We only had 18 mares in the whole little trial. So it's not rocket, you know, we can't draw the biggest conclusion known to man here. But there's no doubt on this small trial, we increased the pregnancy rate in these fluidy mares by going back to them four to six hours after ovulation. So just mind on and have a think of that if, uh, if you're struggling with a mare, uh, it may be beneficial uh, to perform that lavage a little bit earlier than we would normally. Yeah. Well, it doesn't really make a lot of difference because it's a very small molecule and we actually looked at some work measuring pressures and we actually found very little difference between intravenous administration and uh, intramuscular administration. We measured we put balloon catheters in the uterus to measure the pressure in there, which, which we presume equates to how well it empties fluid. I mean, we don't know. That, that was all we could measure. So we put these balloon catheters into the uterus, and we looked at oxytocin at different doses, and we didn't honestly find much difference between intravenous and intramuscular. And I think it's because it's such a small, you know, it has such a short half-life, really. I think if it was a, a, a longer-acting drug, that makes a bigger difference, you root. So I, I, I honestly don't think it makes much difference, intravenous or intramuscular. So I always, you know, I, I always told our stud manager, I mean, some of them were happy to do IV, but if the mares were out in the field and they sent the groom out to do them, they would get it all intramuscularly or even subcutaneously doesn't make any difference. Uh, so I, I, I think it stays just about the same, really, because it doesn't seem to be one of those affected by its route of administration. We didn't measure it with intramuscular administration, so I'm only guessing, and I, I, I'm sure you're, I'm, I, it's, it's going to be a little bit longer, isn't it, one would imagine. But I don't think it seems to have a significant... I think you can just give it more often, two, three times a day. I mean, I, touch wood, I've never had a mare which has developed any sort of reaction to oxytocin, and it's, it, it's such a thin... Uh, well, thin is probably the word, but you know what I mean. I mean, we give it a very narrow, very just small inch long needle. I mean, it isn't like having to give a big penicillin shot in a big, our, our needles are they're, they're 18 gauge needles. The mares hardly notice that you can walk up to them, squeeze it in and done. So I, I don't, but if you, if you think, 
I, I, I don't think it makes a big difference whether you give it intravenous or intramuscular. And I, so I would stick to whatever your findings working for you. History important. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, settle or equistim, and it falls in the category. It's a bunch of. Uh, it, it's a, it's a drug that I've I've looked at and I've read the literature on it. I've not used it, so it's not something I talk about. But I I, I know colleagues are claiming success with it. Does anybody used it or? I, I, I was never minded to use it, but, but that's not the same as saying other people might have a success with it, guys. So I don't want to, I haven't used it, so I don't feel I'm in a position to comment about it. I've read the work. It's difficult to imagine it would be doing any harm. So if, for instance, they said to me, do you want to do a trial on it? I would for them. Uh, I just haven't been minded to, to pay for it, I guess. Um, I'll, I'll probably just leave you on this, side, this thought with something. Uh, and it's important that you understand what I mean by this. I, I've always felt that the, the best chance you have with a mare is the first time you have a go with her. Uh, I don't mean the first heat of the year. I think that there's a good reason that if you've decided you've got a, a 16, 17 year old mare that you know is prone to fluid accumulation, I, I would purposely let her have an, a first ovulation of the year. I would deliberately skip that first ovulation. Uh, two reasons. I think oocyte quality is slightly reduced at that cycle, and if you monitor through that first cycle, it lets uh, the uterus get cleaned up, as it were. I mean, there's nothing like time to help clean a mare's uterus. It's the one thing we normally haven't got for them. So I'd, uh, I, I, I would, would skip that first cycle of the year, but the first time you line a mare up, some people, you know, I, I, I don't think very much of the phrase because, oh, well, we'll give her a go first time. If she doesn't go in foal, well, well, we'll do all the work then. We'll, we'll lavage, we'll do all this. I think you're a little bit behind the game then. You, you've put some infection in. Uh, you've got to get rid of that. You've got an inflamed uterus. You've challenged that uterus once. I'm not saying for a minute you won't be able to do it and get her in foal. But I think your best... Uh, to, to, to do, pull out all the stops at that first go. And I think you'll, you'll have a little bit more chance with that because I think the most successful cycle is that first cycle of the year. So uh, that's a little bit on fluid. I'll, what are we, three o'clock now? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe do one more on the, if we do endometriosis and placentitis maybe, uh, 